Well, one thing I learned in doing years of young adult ministry is that extraordinary kids come from extraordinary parents. And so prior to pastoring Watermark uh, for a, a long time, over a decade, I led a young adult ministry called The Porch. And I don't know if you know this, I feel like I'm talking about it all the time, but people will ask. And so young adults, not youth, sometimes people are like, hey, I know you're in youth ministry, never done youth ministry. I, I love youth ministers, just not my strong suit. But young adults were 20s and 30s, people out of college. And so they would, they would gather there and uh, I really would have a front row seat for the results of parenting because this is when they've left the nest. This is when they're out of college, they're in the real world and that's who I got to minister with. And I would meet these extraordinary adults and just like hear about what it was like growing up in their home. And so one day there was a particular young man who really popped, okay? He uh, wanted to do full-time vocational ministry, just really gifted, understood the Bible, just knew the Bible backwards and forwards, really as well as any young adult I had ever met. And it was just clear that God's hand was on him. And so he was a college athlete. He did track there at Texas A&M. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, two percenters that are here at the 11 a.m. service. Uh, whoops. And so, yeah, he, he did, a call, he, did uh, he was an athlete there. And, um, and I think like when I hung out with him, if I'm honest, and sometimes you do this, just when you, you, you meet gifted young men, I, I wondered about his dad. I was like, man, I bet he had a great dad. I bet his dad like took him camping and uh, on the way to school, you know, would, would teach him the Bible, probably do sword drills with Bible verses and probably coached his baseball team and his dad just poured into him because he was, a, he was a, just a strong young man, really, really gifted. And as I got to know him, his story is that his parents divorced when he was 12 and he was raised by his mama. And that his mom had poured into him all the things of faith that I got to see and personally benefited from. Like who had made him, who God had used to make him who he was, was his mom. And really what young adult ministry taught me is a lot of young men and women that were just extraordinary, were the product of their mamas. And I know that sometimes it can feel like carpools and cleaning and doing dishes. It can feel like you're an Uber driver from one person, one place to the next. I know that it can be exhausting sleepless nights and sick kids and it can be overwhelming. But you're making disciples. That in those moments, those long seasons of faithfulness, disciples are made. And so I wanna talk about with you this morning the legacy of mama, the legacy of a mother. But I know that there's people here that dread this day. I know that, That's that when it became, got late April, you started thinking about this day approaching and it's not happy memories that you have. Maybe you had a bad mom that your example of a mother, she wasn't there. Maybe she you know, puts pressure on you that a mom shouldn't put pressure on someone. Uh, maybe you find yourself in a season of sing singleness where you'd like to be married and you'd like to have kids, you'd love to be celebrated on this day, but there's no prospects and you feel forgotten. Maybe you lost your mom. I know that some of you here today that when this day comes, you long for that relationship with your mom who you miss dearly. Maybe you're in a season of infertility. You, you'd love to be a mom, but that's not where God has you right now. And you're in a season of waiting, wondering if he cares for you. And this day brings back all of those emotions. Or maybe you lost a child. Maybe you lost a child. Maybe outside of the womb or in utero. Or maybe this day serves as the painful reminder of a choice that you've made in the past to have an abortion and you're here this morning and you don't wanna be and you really hoped that I wouldn't be talking to moms on Mother's Day because it's just uncomfortable for you. Hey, I'm glad you're here, welcome home. God has a purpose in you being here and would you hang in there with me? Because I got a message for you too. As I'm talking about the legacy 
of moms today, there's really not anything that I'm going to say that doesn't apply to any follower of Jesus Christ in the call to make disciples. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the call from the scriptures on your life is that you would be and make disciples of Jesus. And so we're going to learn something from the scripture today. I'm going to be in 2 Timothy, if you wanna turn there. And what I don't wanna do, because I've seen other pastors do it, is give this cheesy Mother's Day message where I'm like, hey, your, your work matters, go on, get out there and keep going. And, and you know, you're like, how do you know? <laughs> You've never been a mom, and you're right, I haven't been. I, I don't wanna do that. I, I don't want to put more shame on your shoulders. The enemy works in a mother's life in a really unique way where you can absolutely be crushing it doing all the things that you're supposed to do and he comes alongside you and says, hey, you're not doing enough. You're not good enough. You're not like that mom. And he starts, he starts the comparison game because he loves to distract you by comparing your lives to the highlight reels of other people. Please, please, I, I beg of you, I'm telling you, art of war stuff right now, that's his tactic. Do not let him win. And when you see that, when you feel that, when you sense that, no, this is what Satan does. Please don't let him win. What I wanna do is encourage you from the example of a mother in the scriptures, as we move through this passage in 2 Timothy chapter one, we're going to look at how to live out your faith and receive grace, what it means to let them go and let them grow, and then really a an admonishment, an encouragement to give the gift that keeps on giving. It's a message for mom, which is really a parenting message, which is really, if you're here, you're a college student, you're in any season of life, it's a discipleship message. You have to, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, be about making disciples. It's everything that I say to moms today will apply to any follower of Jesus Christ. But I'm gonna be teaching about Timothy. And Timothy is a key character in the scriptures. Kim, Timothy is Paul's right-hand guy. The apostle Paul wrote about 80% of the New Testament, the greatest missionary that ever lived, the greatest church planter that ever was. So much of what we read in the New Testament and learn about Jesus is the Holy Spirit illuminating those realities through the apostle Paul. And the apostle Paul's favorite guy, his number one Apprentice, his partner in ministry, was a man named Timothy. Paul writes more about Timothy than anyone else other than Jesus. We know a lot about Timothy because of Paul's affections for him. Timothy was known as selfless. This is what Paul writes in Philippians chapter two. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ, but you know that Timothy has proved himself. Because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. If Paul couldn't go somewhere, he would send Timothy. He was known, Timothy was known as an encourager. That's what 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse two says. And he was put into prison. This is what Hebrews 13 tells us. But he never wavered in the faith that Timothy continued in the faithful works of God. And did you know, there, here's a trivia question for you. Who was the first megachurch pastor? It was Timothy. Timothy was the pastor of the largest church in the first century, the church of Ephesus. And Paul entrusted that to him. But it happened against all all odds on his life. A, a really impossible outcome in that day and time. And I'm gonna tell you about that. We're gonna learn more about Timothy as we move through the scripture today. This is what he says in 2 Timothy chapter one, verse five. This is Paul's second letter that he sent to his partner in crime, Timothy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, 
but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. He says, there was a sincere faith that your, your grandmother Lois had, and then she passed it on to your mother Eunice, and then your mother Eunice passed it on to you. And you can picture like an Olympic torch, uh, the flame on an Olympic torch, and one runner taking that torch and passing it on to another, uh, over to Lois, and then Lois running, and then passing it on to Timothy. And they put the spark of faith in his heart. That's what we're seeing in the scripture, the admonishment to fan it into flames, what your mother started. My first point this morning is to live out your faith and receive grace. Discipleship message. Mamas, live out your faith and receive grace. Timothy becomes the greatest leader in Christianity, one of the greatest leaders in Christianity, and the seed that is planted in him is put there by the Holy Spirit through his mother. But I want you to know, his mom didn't just take him to church. She didn't just drag him along with her to church. She surrounded him with the word of God. And we see this, it's, it's so great, the details that the scripture gives us, because in 2 Timothy chapter three, verse 13, this is what it says. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every now and then you'll meet somebody and you'll say, hey, how did you become a Christian? And they'll say, oh, I've always been a Christian. False, no one has always been a Christian. At some point in your journey, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit did that at some point in your journey. Now maybe earlier than you can remember, we don't know, but this would be the closest text that we have is that since infancy, you were surrounded by the word of God. That, that she, your mother, was pouring this into you, surrounding you with the scriptures, even while you were a baby. When we had our first child, we got this changing table. I think we got it at a garage sale or on Craigslist or something. But we kept it through all the kids. And, uh, and you know, it was, it was one of the most prayed over pieces of furniture we had because you're so helpless when they're at that stage and, and they're squirming, you're trying to change their diapers and so you just pray a lot, right? And, and Monica would, would, she took these Bible verses and she framed them over that changing table. And so I don't know if they were you know, encouragement for us or for them, but they, there they were as we tried to change diapers, there were these eternal truths over us. And in the center of those eternal truths were the gospel. And so as we, when the kids were infants, we would read these scriptures to them in hopes that the Holy Spirit would plant something in them that would hold them to the path of following Jesus. What I want you to know, friends, is faith is caught more than it's taught. Faith is caught more than it's taught. Sometimes children will do what you say, but they will most always follow your example. It's interesting because through the years, people will come up to me like, yeah, church, not really my thing. Organized religion, don't really, yeah, the institution, not really about that. But I take my, I, I think it's good for the kids. I take the kids. And, and I just want you to know, that's one of the worst things you can do. It's one of the worst things that you can do. It is one of the greatest evils in our country today is this shallow, counterfeit Christianity where you're trying to bargain with God. It's some kind of karma. You think, well, I'm gonna do whatever I want throughout the week, but maybe if I just show up into that building for an hour on Sunday, he'll see me as okay. That's not the gospel. It's Eastern philosophy. It's heresy and it's of Satan. It is inconsistent with what the Bible teaches and everything we know about God, right? That he desires a relationship with you and the greatest thing that you can do for your children is show them that you have a relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth. Not just to say this is what the Bible says but to actually live it out. 
to actually live out the word of God, to do what it says. Like you can't go to them and say, hey, you know, it's really important that you share your faith, but never share your faith. Like, like they will know kids are smart. They'll be like, oh, it's, it's not important. He says it's important, but it's not important. That's the reality of what happens. And so this, this thing, it comes into the home. Faith, it comes into the home and it spreads. When it's in the home, it spreads. Right? It's like COVID-19, right? Coronavirus. When, when someone has it, like you'll hear them, if they have a household, a home, right? You'll, you'll talk to them and they'll be like, oh yeah, we, we have COVID. <laughs> it's hit our family. And what they're saying is, you know, those conversations are like, well, you know, I've got, I got di- uh, tested positive, but, and, and then she's got the sniffles and he's got a cough and, and they're running a fever and we got the O2 sensor and we're, we're doing all the things, but I think everyone in our family's got it because it comes in the home and it spreads. It's contagious. Once it's brought in the house and you're in close proximity with each other, it spreads. And in the same way, when faith comes in the home and it begins to live out and you prioritize the things of God and you surround others in your home with the scripture, it spreads like a great virus. It's contagious. But there's something else amazing happening here. And I don't know if you know. Eunice, Eunice had a past. Eunice wasn't Sunday school Susie. She wasn't faithfully walking with Jesus. Like she got mixed up in the things. She, she went to college and got in a sorority and she met this guy who wasn't following Jesus and they had a night together and then Timothy happened. Here's what it says, Acts 16. Paul came to Derby and then the Lystra where, he, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer. So she's Jewish by ethnicity, but she's a follower of Jesus Christ, but whose father was a Greek. The believers in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of Timothy. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Everybody knew what had happened, okay? Everybody knew that Eunice got pregnant by this guy who was not a Jew, and we think, what's the big deal about that? In this culture, it would have been an enormous deal. Eunice isn't allowed to worship with them. She's not allowed to come near them. And then Timothy, this love child, okay, he's what's called a momser, seen as illegitimate. He can't even marry a Jewish girl. Right, this is the culture that they live in. Timothy, you'll never mount to anything because the choices that your mama made. But God, but he finds a home with Jesus in the Christian church. Now this is a picture of the church today, right? People come in here looking for hope, rejected by the world, and we say, hey, welcome home. We're glad you're here. You had an abortion, welcome home. We're glad you're here. Receive God's grace. You feel rejected. You don't like the season that you're in. Everyone's turning their back on you. People are asking you, hey, come here. Welcome home. You have a place here, and God has a purpose. He's going to take your past and make it your platform. He's going to take your mess and make it your message. This is what he does over and over and over and over and over throughout the scripture. It's what he did with the Apostle Paul. It's what he did with Timothy's mama, and it's what he did with Timothy the pastor of the largest church of the known world when this letter's written, okay? And it says that, it says he wasn't circumcised. So in order to do ministry with Paul, so that everybody knew he wasn't circumcised. So to do ministry, he had to get circumcised. <laughs> you guys, Y'all think we have a high bar of membership here, you know? You're like, oh, you gotta make me get in a life group, you know, I'm gonna have to serve. They didn't have anesthesia, okay? Like this is, this is a Flint 
rock. It's a sharp rock of a, with a grown man. Now, I'm not going to put charts and graphs up on the screen, but I'm just telling you, this is a high bar to follow Jesus. And Timothy's like, I'm in. Like, whatever's going to help me make Christ famous, I'm in. If you want to sign up for adult circumcision, we do have, no, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That's not, we're not, we're not, we're not rolling like that. The truth is that extraordinary kids are an extraordinary grace. That sometimes God breaks all the rules and just does extraordinary things by his grace. And I think far too often we take way too much credit when they turn out great and far too much blame when they don't. There's this part that's not up to you. Maybe your greatest strategy is a whole lot of prayer and, and turning them over to God and saying, Lord, please, because I want you to know there's no perfect moms. And some of you mothers, you gotta give yourself a break. You're doing the best you can and you're walking and it's not through those catalyst moments, right? It's through long obedience of faithfulness. Long obedience in the same direction. And grace will cover a multitude of parenting mistakes. It really will. Remember that. You didn't have perfect parents. You're not a perfect parent. And it's never too late. It's not too late. If you're here and you're about making disciples, it's the same reality for you. Live out your faith and trust God in your misses. Live out your faith and trust God in your misses because there's this responsibility, this aspect of this that's on them. Let me read it to you, verse six. For this reason, I remind you, the you there is Timothy. Timothy, I remind you for this reason, the reason, because of what your grandmother passed on to your mother who passed on to you, for this reason, I want to remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Your mom taught you to know God, now you need to grow in the faith. Fan the flame. She placed the spark there. Now, now give it some oxygen so that it turns into a blaze in your heart and you wouldn't be just another lukewarm Christian, but that you would live out your faith. Number two, my second point, let them go and let them grow. You place the spark, you surrounded them with the scriptures. Now what they do with that is up to them and up to God. Right? One of the, the greatest things that you can do for your kids is just then move to that strategy of prayer. Like, Lord, I need you to move here. I need you to do something. The reality is you can't save anyone. Salvation's a sovereign act of the Spirit. So you plead with God to move in the hearts of people. That's a message for everybody. All of us can think about lost people in our lives, particularly in our families and say, let's double down in prayer for them, that God would move in their hearts. I know Proverbs 22, verse six says, start children off on the way that they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. But I want you to know something. That's a principle, not a promise. Okay, this is not one of the promises of God. This is from the book of wisdom. It's a principle. Generally speaking, as you show kids the way that they're to go, they'll continue in that path. But not always. That's the extraordinary grace that is parenting. And one of the greatest things that you can do for your child is to give them the opportunities to fail, to hold them loosely, open-handed, to let them go and to let them grow. Not to swoop in, not to hover over them, not to remove obstacles always, not to intervene in their conflict and make things okay. Like something, sometimes things need to not be okay. And they gotta sit in that. In years of young adult ministry, I've seen just about every kind of abuse you can possibly imagine. Any kind of situation I, I counsel, I've counseled through, you, you'd be hard pressed to come up with something that I haven't seen or sat with in somebody. Well, often at the hands of a family member, sometimes at the hands of parents. And I think, as I think through the two of the greatest victims, the second 
most wounded person I have ever seen in my entire life. The second most wounded person I'd ever seen in my entire life. We were, I remember when we met just right at the front of the stage years and years ago, and I was trying to figure out what happened. What happened to you? Why are you so hurt? And he couldn't even say the word, and it was abandonment to put a word on it. His parents had turned their backs on him and, and just just rejected him as a child and he was on his own and, and they didn't love him, but he couldn't say they deserted me, they left me. He would just stumble over the idea. The second most wounded person I'd ever seen. And we're kind of like, that makes sense because that's that's really hard thing. But the, the first most wounded person I had ever met, it, it was very difficult. It was a very difficult situation. I remember one time I found him under a bridge holding a gun to his head. And I took it from him. And I had to call his parents and tell him, hey, I have his gun. And I remember partnering with his counselor and his psychologist, trying to help him get well. And I remember this conversation with his counselor where I was just like, it doesn't make sense to me. It seems like he has a great relationship with his parents. They talk every day, all the time. They seem like really loving people. I don't understand. And I remember the counselor saying, well, that's just it. What he struggles with is enmeshment. I had never heard that word. And I was like, what is enmeshment? Like, well, his life and his parents' lives are too closely intertwined. He's never learned independence. Any problem that he's come across in life, they've swooped in and cared for him in. The most wounded person I've ever experienced in ministry. Right? So some of the most, sometimes the most loving thing you can do is let them go and let them grow, Right? We all know in parenting how important boundaries are. So when they're younger, right, you, you have to give them boundaries to their phone and boundaries to YouTube, and boundaries to TV shows, right? You, you have to teach them boundaries because these are gateways to all kinds of evil. But as they grow older, you have to teach them boundaries from you. That's a hard truth. It's a hard truth. But you, you know, as they, as they get married, and you say, well, how often would you like to see us? What, what should that relationship look like? And, and I want you to know, we won't just show up unannounced if that's not what you want. Like, let's talk through this because we wanna set you up for the most success that we possibly can. And, and how can we ensure that, that you see your in-laws a healthy amount of time? And let's talk through holidays for a minute. What are you gonna do at Christmas? And what would it look like for us to free you up to, to be, you know, to start your new family? Because this is what the scripture says in Genesis chapter two, and Jesus repeats it in the gospel. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is known as the leave and cleave verse, that you leave and you cleave and you have a new family. And sometimes in this first century, that meant a, a move off. That meant a goodbye. I'm not saying that, that needs, that's what it needs to be here. I, don't, I wouldn't want that. Personally, I wouldn't want that, right? We, we want to maintain healthy relationships. But you want to be thinking about as the parenting stages change, what does it look like for me to free them up, to fan the flame of the faith that I have surrounded them with? When you're younger, when your kids are younger rather, when your children are younger, you're the driver. You take them where they're going. You, you swerve to miss the potholes. You slow down in the speed bumps. Like you're the driver when they're younger. As they grow older, you become a road sign. A road sign is this unemotional thing that says, hey, I just want to remind you that you need to slow down to 40 miles per hour before you take this curve. I just want to remind you right, that this is an intersection that you yield in. It's, I'm not emotional. I'm just reminding you of the truth that I surrounded you with when you were younger. When, you're, when they're younger, you're the driver. When they're older, you're a road sign. Let the spirit work, right? That's, that's a message for discipleship. Show them where to go and trust the Holy Spirit. Because the spirit's doing something in their lives, verse seven. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. 
My third point is give the gift that keeps on giving. Give the gift that keeps on giving. Think about what that scripture says. The spirit God gave us, he gave it to us, and it continues to give us power, love, and self-discipline. God gave this gift that continues to give love, power, self-discipline, courage. The spirit does not give us he does not give us a spirit of timidity, one that is timid, but a power, love, and self-discipline. And so the, the, the gift that keeps on giving is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the gift that keeps on giving. But here's the problem. You can't give the Holy Spirit. You don't have that power to entrust. You can't say, hey, come here, come here, come here. You got the Spirit now. You, don't, you can't do that, right? But what you can do is share the gospel. And so if you're here, if you're here and you have trusted in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then the greatest thing that you can do is take that baton, take that torch, and pass it on to other people. That, that central to your business, to your work, to your message, to the places you go, to your existence, is the gospel. This is not preacher talk, guys. One day, listen, I'm gonna say this with all confidence, one day, you're gonna absolutely know that what I'm saying right now is correct if you don't believe it right now. That the most important thing about you and the greatest stewardship of your life is continuing to further this message of the gospel. Now, I imagine there's some of you that aren't always in church, and here's why I say that, because did you know that Mother's Day is the third most attended Sunday in our country for church? Did you guys know that? Now, it's different here at Harris Creek. We kind of follow a college calendar, but I imagine there's a lot of you that are guests here today, that you're, you're visiting, maybe for graduation, uh, you're not usually with us. Mother's Day is the third most attended Sunday in the country, why? Because you say, mom, what do you want for church? I mean, what do you want for Mother's Day? And they're like, I want us to go to church. I want us to all be together, right? That's what they're like, hey, mom, what, I, what do you want? It's your day, mom, what do you want for church? I want us to all go to church together. Some of you, you laugh because you heard that, you know, like yesterday or, or this morning. What do you want? I want us to all be together. We're gonna sit in the row, like there, right? I'm not even gonna put you in kids ministry today. We're gonna sit right beside me. It's my day, I'll do what I want, right? I, yes, w way to go, we're, we're glad you're here. So I imagine, you know, just like Christmas and Easter, it's an opportunity for me to share the gospel. Let me do that for a second. The gospel is just a word that means good news. And the good news, the good news is that you can live with God forever. And it has nothing to do with what you do or what you've done and everything to do with what he's done on your behalf. That every soul that you know right now, any person that you come in contact with, every single breathing being that has ever been and will ever be, will be in one of two destinations one day. Heaven forever with God or separated for, from him eternally in hell. That's the truth. Every single person. Now, listen. Right? You, you might think, well, good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. That is a bad theology. It's false. It's not what the scripture teaches. What the scripture teaches is there, was no, there is no one good, not even one. How good enough do you have to be to go to heaven? You'll never be good enough to get into heaven. The only person that can go to heaven is someone who's been forgiven. Let me explain. In hell, there's only one item to do. There's only one agenda item, one to-do list, one thing on it. Suffer for your sins forever. Let me say it in a different way. Pay for your sins forever. That's the only thing there is to do in hell. Pay for your sins forever. You think, well, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna pay for my sins forever. Here's the good news, the gospel. Jesus paid for your sins. He laid down the payment. You can pick it up. You can accept it. You can say, oh, I don't wanna pay for my sins. If he covered the bill, I'll accept his payment. When you see that crucifix, the bleeding Jesus, the crown of thorns, the, the nails in his hands and feet on, on those two pieces of wood, you need to see a payment. That was a payment. What he did there was he paid for your sins. And you have the ability, you can trust, you, you can look at that and say, that was for me. God, I've sinned against you. I'll never be good enough to be in your presence, but you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to pay for my sins. I accept that payment, and now I'm gonna be with you forever because he's paid for your sins, past, present, and future. That's what happened on the cross. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And I want you to know that. Yeah, praise him. Praise him. I want you to know that. 
to talk to dads for a second. You, you know what the second least attended Sunday is in our country? <laughs> the second least attended Sunday in our country is Father's Day. Now why? She said, Mom, what do you want for Mother's Day? I want to go to church. I want us all to be together. Okay, you got it, Mom. We're going to go. We'll, we'll drive in. We'll fly in. Be with you. Dad, what do you want for Father's Day? I want to play golf. Uh, I want to watch the game. I, I want to stay. I want to. I want to go hunting. I want to. I, I want to just sit here in my lazy boy and watch my. That's what I want to do, right? And and on those days, you give to the respective parent whatever they want. Mother's Day is the most attended Sunday. Father's Day is one of the least attended Sundays. Mother's Day is one of the most attended. Father's Day is one of the least. Dads, I think one of the greatest gifts that I can give to moms today is just to say, hey, step up. Can you step up your game? Let's not add to that statistic and let the gospel be central to everything that we're doing. Because this deal that I want to strike is like, hey, I go and I work and, and you got this, right? You handle this. And I know I'm saying that out loud. You're gonna use that against me later. I know, I know you don't get to feel those eyes. <laughs> Here's the deal, right? We can do better. Norman Rockwell was just brilliant in one of his works of art called Sunday Morning. Let me show it to you. This is a painting called Sunday Morning. Now this is from decades ago. But, but there's the mom dressed for Sunday morning and in front of her is a daughter and behind her is another daughter and they are focused on the door. They are focused on getting to church. But behind them, pulling up the caboose is the sun. And if you look at the son's head, it's slightly tilted inward, staring at the father as though to say, when do I get to do that? Why do I have to go to this place where I'm bored for an hour and I daydream? When can I get to stay at home with my Sunday paper and a cigarette in my lazy boy recliner and do nothing? I can't wait till I have that freedom. And it's contagious like COVID, okay? And I want you to know it's one of the greatest evils in our country. In fact, if you zoom in on this, you'll see how brilliant Norman Rockwell is because dad doesn't just have bed head, okay? He, he's saying what this man is doing is satanic. It is a work of the devil. Do you understand? As he puts those two horns in his head. Yeah. And, and so I think we gotta step up our game, man. Not, not just us in our home, like as a country. And so... I know that's probably awkward for some of you, and I gotta, I gotta tell you, I really don't care. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's kind of what I do for a living, make people uncomfortable. <laughs> and, uh, and so here's what you can do after this. At lunch, I, I want you to, hear, men, here's the assignment. You turn to them and just say, hey, how can I do better in partnering with you? It's just that simple question. Sit on your hands, don't say another word. Listen, absorb everything they say, not the time to say, wait, wait, hold on, I did that. No, just, just say, don't do that. Just sit there, sit on your hands, listen, lean in, right? And then whenever they're done talking, okay, 20 minutes later, say. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. Say, I will do that. I will do that. I, I will try harder, okay? So, so the assignment, to be clear, how can I do better? in helping you and just ask that question, how can I do better at partnering with you? As single friends, here's what I want you to know, single friends, you do not need to wait until you're married to start making disciples. You thought I was gonna say babies, not babies. You need to wait until you're married to start making babies. But disciples, right? This is something that you can do right now as you begin to invest in lives around you, some of my favorite moms were never married. Some of, some of the most amazing moms I know never had biological children of their own. We can talk about Mother Teresa, who was a mother to the lepers in Calcutta. We can talk about Amy Carmichael, who started the mission in India to, to lost people and was a mother to many through an orphanage that she began there. We could talk about Katie Davis, who, who at 20 years old adopted 13 uh, children 
13 children from Uganda at 20 years old. Right? And, and you think, well, yeah, that's the kind of stuff. Those are some legends of the faith. That's what books are made of. Right here at Harris Creek, there are two sisters who are fostering children with the help of their community, their life group, right? Investing in the lives of others. Unmarried sisters caring for children and parents, right? That's happening here. And they're not the only ones. That's amazing. And so if you're here and you have margin that you can foster, or maybe you don't have margin and God will just have to miraculously show up, sometimes that's what he does. As you stop by that booth on your way out and say, can I just get information? And maybe it's not fostering. Maybe you just give to the ministry your discretionary time and you serve there. Right? But the message is about making disciples. And if you're male or female, Married or single, regardless of your season of life, that is the call of the scripture on your life. Moms, we love you. We celebrate you today, and your work does matter. The menial tasks that are exhausting are paying an eternal reward, and I've seen it and I've benefited from it. In summary, live out your faith and receive grace. Let them go and let them grow and give the gift of the gospel. I've heard that in the same way that I've heard extraordinary kids come from extraordinary parents and extraordinary kids are often in extraordinary grace. I've heard that the greatest test of a leader is what happens when they leave. And so as I you consider that young adult ministry, what God did over a decade plus serving there is he grew it, and this is not a flex, I'm just telling you this for context, okay? He grew it to be the largest ministry of its kind in the world. And so 18 campuses, 50,000 people are watching weekly messages. And so when, I'm, when God began to call us to Waco, right, and this is in between there, we pastored a church there in Dallas, but. But as God began to call us to Waco, right, I have to start thinking through successor. Who's gonna, who am I gonna hand this ministry to, right? And as I started thinking through people, the, the obvious choice was that young man who was poured into by his mom. I'm so thankful for his mom and her faithfulness. And you guys know David, if you're here at Harris Creek, he's taught here recently, right? And he's actually taught on this passage, the very passage that I'm in today. And, and this is what he said, watch this. I love the story of Timothy um, because it's my story. I was raised in a home where I did not have a godly father around. There wasn't an example of someone to teach me how to um, be a godly man, love a woman, do any of those things. I was raised, but I did have a Eunice. I did have a godly mother who raised me and three other kids on her own, almost exclusively. And she brought us up, and she, as I think back, and the reasons I'm so thankful for her, and like even the protection in my life, and the ways that God, and there's no like trophy kid here, I just look back and I'm so thankful for my mom, and how God used her to really be a source of protection in my life, to teach and train, to fill in the gaps that a father should have filled beginning of that video, he said, I love Timothy's story because Timothy's story is my story. And I would tell you I love David's story because David's story is similar to my story. I had a dad, an amazing dad. He died in 2020 to COVID-19. And uh, I learned a lot of things from my dad. I learned work ethic from my dad. I learned morality from my dad. He always would tell me to always do a person right, never lie, always tell the truth. I did not learn the scriptures from my dad. My mom was a spiritual leader of our family. And I would be hard pressed, like no matter how early I got up, like sometimes I had basketball tournaments and I'd get up early in the morning and there was this front living room on, on the front of our house and I would walk by it and, and there would always be, like all the lights in the house were off except for that room, there would be a lamp on by the dining room table with her Bible open. And I don't know what time she would wake up and start reading the word, but that's what she was always doing when I got up. And I gotta tell you, I wasn't interested in that book. 
There was nothing about it that interested me, but I was interested in the fact that she was interested in it. Like there was something strong in her life that I knew was foundational because of what she was doing in that morning. And when I left the path and I wondered and I sowed my wild oats, and I partied and I did what I wanted to do, it was like the Lord placed a talent in my heart to pull me back into relationship with him. And, and she would lead with such humility and respect and esteem my father. I can remember we sit at the, the table and she'd always have these devotionals, you know, and she'd turn it to a page and she'd flip it around and hand it to him and say, hey, why don't you just read this for a second? And she would do that with such grace and power and love self-discipline my dad taught me a lot of things I'm very thankful for many of the things that he taught me but I'm in ministry because of my mom and I'm telling you your work matters now I have the amazing opportunity to benefit from Monica's mom and so many of the moms that I've met here that are investing in the lives of children. Sometimes those children are two. Sometimes there's tw they're 22. Sometimes they're 42. You praying for them. That the Spirit of God would move in their hearts, being a road sign. If you take this curve faster than 40, you're going to flip over. Don't do it. Grateful for you, moms. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. We thank you for the family unit. It's a gift from you to exemplify to us who you are. And none of us, not one of us, has had an example of a perfect family unit. And so in the gaps, would your grace fill them? And I know that for some of us, the gaps are bigger than others. Would your grace and your mercy fill them? I imagine, God, that there are people in this room today who find themselves in a place of worship on Sunday morning that don't know you. Would your Holy Spirit overwhelm them, their hearts and turn them so that they would have a relationship with you and they wouldn't just think, oh, that's, that's good news. They, they would think that's good news for me. I thank you for the moms here. I thank you for the sleepless nights. I thank you for the exhausting days. And I thank you for the perseverance. Would you just lift their spirits, give them hope. And for those that are here with a cynical, heart towards this day, would you rush in with healing? Help them and heal them so that they wouldn't resent this day, that they would see it as, as steps that they would take toward a healed heart, a healthy heart. We love you, God. We worship you now. Amen.